contact, making contact, making, making, making contact. This week on Making Contact, we're talking about self-managed abortion. Experts at the World Health Organization have said it's safe and effective for people to manage their own first trimester abortions without clinicians using the pills mifepristone and misoprostol. The WHO's definition is that self-care is the ability of individuals, of families, of communities to protect their own health, prevent disease, maintain health, and this can be done with the support of a health worker or also by themselves. But concern about legal repercussions is keeping some in conservative states from talking about abortion resources openly. We can't and won't make referrals for how to obtain medications, and we can't and won't give any instructions on how to do a self-managed abortion. Um, This is because the legal situation is complicated and We're not medical experts. Despite restrictive laws, activists and scholars and regular folks are working to reach the people who need it most. This team has been working on making sure that people know how to access uh, abortion pills online and to manage their abortion safely. Um, And it's the most comprehensive guide to abortion pills on the interwebs that they give you information on where to get pills, how to order them, and information about legalities, which is really important. Stay with us. Before we start, I want to say that this story is about post-row access to abortion, a topic that is constantly evolving. This story is being produced for broadcast in April 2023. Things may have changed by the time you hear it. Hi, this is Jess from All Options and the Hoosier Fund. Jessica Marchbank is the state programs manager at All Options Pregnancy Resource Center in Bloomington, Indiana. She has a small office with a large computer screen. She's answering text messages from people who need help. Right now, she's following up on the phone with someone who needed funding for an abortion. Oh, good. Are you all set? You don't need any additional financial assistance? Okay. Oh, that's fantastic. I'm really, really happy to hear that. If anything changes, don't hesitate to get in touch and we'll be here, okay? You are very welcome. Take care. Bye-bye. Well, that's an unusual instance when we're ready to offer someone money and they say, somebody else already gave you money. I'm good. That's great. All options really means all options. This is a place people come for referrals to baby clothes, breastfeeding support, adoption services, help with infertility, and for abortion funding. The storefront of the building sits on a busy road in southern Indiana. It's packed floor to ceiling with diapers. Last year, they distributed 140,000 diapers to Bloomington parents. I sort of jokingly say sometimes, my day is all about abortions and diapers. And sometimes they're the same people. Okay, so last summer after Roe v. Wade was overturned, Jessica started getting more calls and texts. It went from about 30 per week to more like 60. More people needed help paying for their abortions. It's gotten more expensive, and because of restrictive laws, people are having to travel more for services. And here's the thing. The world's leading health experts say there is a safe, effective, convenient, and inexpensive method to have an abortion, but all options staff can't talk about it. They can't tell people how to get and use the medications mifepristone and misoprostol so they can manage their abortions at home. We're going to talk more about self-managed abortion, but first, stick with me for some background. After Roe, Indiana was the first state in the nation to create and pass a new law banning abortion. But it was only a week before plaintiffs, including all options, sued the state. They were granted an injunction 
which stopped the ban from going into effect. Which means abortion in Indiana right now is is just as it was one year ago under under Roe and um, how things were one year ago. So that means um, generally you can get an abortion in Indiana up to 13 weeks, six days. But the judge in the case could make a decision at any moment. Meanwhile, if you're more than 14 weeks pregnant, you need to travel out of Indiana for services, usually to Illinois. And while we send residents to Illinois, people from Ohio and Kentucky are coming here for abortions because their laws are even more restrictive. The legal status in both Kentucky and Ohio has been just a nightmare. Um, just so with the back and forth and all over the place. Forth. And is it legal? Is it not legal? Currently in Kentucky, um, abortion is not happening. The closest clinic in Indiana for someone, say, in, in Louisville is going to be Bloomington. It's not exactly accessible for a lot of people. That's like a three hour drive. It made me wonder if people calling from hundreds of miles away ever ask about self-managed abortion for an early pregnancy. She said out of the last 500 calls she's gotten, Jessica's probably been asked about self-management three times. Generally, people are just not asking about self-managed abortion. Not nearly as much as I would have thought, given all of the legal complications. I, um... I need to make sure I have our specific language. We're very careful in what we say. Mm -hmm. Jessica's pulling up a document on her big screen. We can't and won't make referrals for how to obtain medications. And we can't and won't give any instructions on how to do a self-managed abortion. Um, this is because the legal situation is complicated and... We're not medical experts. I see that you're reading mm -hmm. literally mm -hmm. from a form that's guidelines and protocols around this. Yeah, Right. So um, if someone asks us point blank, how do I get abortion pills online? Um, can you help with that? We first affirm that it sounds like they're being thoughtful and wanting to explore all of their options. And we'll say that some folks have chosen to do a self-induced or self-managed abortion by ordering pills online or through the mail. We do caution them that ordering them through the mail is considered to be outside the purview of licensed medical care in the United States. And some people who have ended their own pregnancies have been arrested and charged with crimes. We don't say this to scare people. We don't want to be scaring people, but we want to make sure that they have all of the information. It's harder than ever to get an abortion, but it's the worst for people living in the rural South and Midwest. And even when Roe was the law of the land, it still wasn't easy there. Loretta Ross is a founder of the reproductive justice movement. Last year, while everyone was confused about what to do, she reminded people of the long view. This is from a virtual TED Talk. I think the main thing I'd like the audience to remember is that from time immemorial, women have been doing what is ever necessary to protect our bodies, to raise our children, to ensure good futures for ourselves. And so I wanna urge people to always see a post-road world as something that we've always been facing. And as a black woman, I wanna say in particular, we have never had confidence in the Supreme Court or the U.S. government to protect our human rights. What we're going to do is make sure that we center the most vulnerable people in the center of our lives. We're going to do whatever is necessary in order to get their human rights protected. Yes, Roe gave us the legal protection to get an abortion, to have an abortion, but so many people did not have real access to abortion, right? Dr. Melissa Madera is a researcher and consultant on lots of projects related to abortion access. She says people who have the hardest time getting care are those who live far from a city, are marginalized by gender identity, race, or immigration status. And many people, many, many, many people do not have the financial ability to access abortion. Um, so we have to really think about that. 
Yes, Roe gave us legal access to abortion, but it didn't actually give us all access to abortion all the time whenever we needed it. A lot of people in this movement are talking about um, this being kind of a chance to make something that's actually better than Roe. And I'm wondering if you can speak to what was wrong with Roe and why we need a something better. How can we, right now in the middle of this sort of like (laughs) terrible time, it's even hard to think about how we can make it better, right? It's going to take a really long time to figure that out. I think what's really important to think about is that we need multiple avenues to abortion care. Not one way is is the right way for everyone, right? Um, And even in states where abortion is still accessible, um, and I hate using the word legal or, you know, talking about legalities because I don't want to give the law (laughs) any real legitimacy because it's not legitimate. Like it, this is, this is not legitimate. This is not, um, this is, this should not have happened. Right. And so I think what's really important to think about is like, we need various ways, various avenues for people to access abortion. And we should start thinking about how do we construct that for the day in which everyone in every state will be able to access abortion or have legal access to abortion. Again, using the word legal, um, you know, in the future. But even now, there are various ways for people to access care. um, And there there should always be various ways, right? One of these ways is through self-managed abortion. People giving themselves an abortion has always been a thing. Folks have used herbs, teas, and other methods passed down from families and cultural traditions for generations. Some of those traditions are still used today, but more and more people are using the prescription medications mifepristone and misoprostol. This is how it works. Medical abortion, often referred to as the abortion pill, is a safe and effective way of ending a pregnancy. The pill is usually taken within the first 12 weeks of gestation. The whole process can take up to two weeks to complete, although most women feel normal again after just two days. What can you expect from a medical abortion? Misoprostol causes cramping and bleeding to empty the uterus. It can feel like a heavy period, and it's not uncommon to pass large blood clots during the process. Side effects can include diarrhea and vomiting, tiredness, mild fever or chills, headaches, and dizziness. To ease pain and discomfort, some of the following may help. Staying at home or in a comfortable space when taking the pills. Taking ibuprofen or painkillers before the procedure. Having a hot bath or shower. Ensuring a friend or family member present to help reassure and comfort you. Having an emergency plan in place for any potential complications. Within 24 to 48 hours, most women feel fine to return to their daily routine. Using these pills to end a pregnancy is not new. The Food and Drug Administration first approved them more than 20 years ago in 2000. Before that, abortions were done as a procedure, kind of like a vacuum removing the contents of the uterus. These procedures are still available if you have access to a provider. But since they were approved, the pills have been used more and more. In 2020, More than half of all abortions in the U.S. were done with these pills. So before pandemic lockdowns, a pregnant person would take the mifepristone at the clinic with the provider there and then go home to take the misoprostol. Most of the process was done without very much involvement by a healthcare provider. They just hand you a pill. Then in April 2021, the process got even more independent from providers when the FDA allowed clinicians to mail the pills to clients to avoid COVID spread. These changes allowed simplified access to the medications, but you still had to make an appointment to get the pills, complete a visit, and pay on average $560, even though you take the pill and go through most of the process at home, alone. But last spring, something wildly important happened. The World Health Organization said people could use these pills to end a pregnancy in the first 12 weeks without the guidance or involvement or cost of a medical provider. 
the world as we know has seen increased pressures from pandemics, from conflicts, from climate change. And these situations have further propelled the need for um, self-care interventions. And, and this includes the rational delegation of tasks to, to lay persons so that they can manage their health. Dr. Manjula Nasiman works in the WHO's Department of Sexual and Reproductive Health. She says worldwide, increasing instability from climate change and conflicts, it leaves people cut off from healthcare providers. She says self-managed care for all kinds of diseases and health issues is the medicine of the future. But we need to be mindful that we do this in a way that is equitable. And it really will require transforming the power dynamics that we have in health service delivery, in the health systems. She's talking about the thing that Dr. Madera and Loretta Ross brought up. As self-managed care becomes more widespread, it has to be made available to the most vulnerable people, people in rural areas, black and brown people, gender non-conforming people, undocumented people. What do they need? How do they get access? They say that should be the central question. I'm Salima Hamarani. You're listening to Making Contact and a story about self-managed abortion in the United States. If you like today's show and want more information, or if you'd like to leave us a comment, visit us at radioproject.org, where you can access today's show and all of our prior episodes. And now, back to the show with Amy Castellan. Hey, welcome back to the show. In the second half, we're going to talk about how people are finding out about self-managed abortion and how they're doing it. Melissa Madera, the American researcher we heard from earlier, she says managing an abortion without a provider has been happening around the world for a long time, but it's new territory for a lot of Americans. So she led a study that asked people to talk about what it was like for them. For some people, like... They want to use these pills and they are like, oh, I know it's safe and I can do this on my own. Some people are like, well, I don't really want to do that. Um, and so one of the most important things to me is like, we need to trust people, right? To make the right decision that is good for them based on their own circumstances. And we need to respect that and give them all the options so they can do the right thing for them. Unlike the WHO, American health leaders at the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, or ACOG, they don't have a collective message about self-managed abortion. They're against criminalizing people for managing their own abortions, but they don't say much beyond that. This leaves Americans in the dark, and it makes real health care, people's bodies, political bargaining chips. Right now in the U.S., mifepristone is a hot potato, shifting between courts and business deals among the powerful, leaving Americans vulnerable. In Texas, a judge recently ruled in favor of a physician-led anti-abortion activist group to overturn the FDA's approval of mifepristone. Washington state was ready for the Texas ruling, and a judge there opposed the decision. This created a standoff. Ultimately, it means mifepristone, whether for self-management or even with the involvement of a clinician, may not be available to all Americans in all states. Meanwhile, as Loretta Ross predicted, organizations have created ways to bypass providers and sometimes legal restrictions. One of those routes is Plan C pills. Dr. Melissa Madera, who we heard from earlier, is a special projects consultant for the organization. Plan C Pills offers a website where people can search by state to find abortion pills by various means. PlanCPills.org. Okay, I'm going to go to it right now. PlanCPills.org. So I search Mississippi and I can see that there are several ways people get abortion pills in Mississippi, even if state laws restrict clinic-based care. We've got aid access, community support networks, 
online pharmacies and mail forwarding. And if you click on that, um, there's also some information about the the legality of using these services. So, so it, it's it's got you covered. Plain Sea Pills has you covered for how to get access in whatever state you're in, which which that's new to me. How long has this been up and running? Do you know? Oh, since 2015. I have to admit, this was a shock to me. I've been a mother baby public health nurse since 2008, and I had never heard of Plan C pills before I started reporting this story. Not from doctors, not from colleagues, and never from leadership anywhere I've worked. Before um, the access issues got the worse, which is right now. Right. Um, Seven years ago, they were seven, eight years ago, right? We're in 2023 now. Um, they were thinking, the, the co-founders were thinking, like, how can we let people know more about how to get abortion pills online? Because people have been doing this and using abortion pills on their own, self-managing um, in other countries for many, many years. Yeah. So the thought was, oh, this ha- this is something that's happening globally. People in the U.S. should also know about it because we all know that even though we have we or we had um, the right to an abortion, many people didn't have access to abortion. So the question is, how can we get more access to people? And abortion pills is one of those ways. Um, So, yeah, it's been a long time um, that this team has been working on making sure that people know how to access uh, abortion pills online and to manage their abortion safely. Um, And it's the most comprehensive guide to abortion pills on the interwebs. Uh, So (laughs) you can go online and search very specifically for your state. Um, And as you said, they give you information on where to get pills, how to order them, and information about legalities, which is really important. And then resources around if you have questions about um, the medical aspects of things while you're self-managing, if you have questions about the legal aspects of things, also resources for those. Abortion access is still piecemeal and complex, but there's a network helping people get access. There's Plan C pills, abortion on our own terms, the Repro Legal Helpline, and lots more. These groups are helping people get access to self-managed abortion and protection from criminalization. Back in All Options, Jessica Marchbank says that while more people are in need, a lot of the community has come forward to pitch in. Um, Starting really with the Supreme Court leak that happened in May, um, that led to a lot of increased donations, which was fantastic because we're able to support more people. So starting in April, my weekly budget for for the abortion fund was about $4,000, which feels like a lot of money, but it meant that every week there were a bunch of people we could not support. The additional donations has allowed us to spend more money, which means we say yes to, like if they live in Indiana or if they're coming into Indiana, they're going to get some form of money from us, um, 100% of people. And we would not have been able to do that with our previous budget. We also have had a huge outpouring of people who want to help with driving people to appointments or basically help in some way help people access abortion. And that's that has been heartwarming for sure. There have been a lot of little pop-up donation events. Um, somebody did a Buffy prom last weekend and raised $4,000 for us. Just randomly, like a random person we who didn't was even, just... They, yeah, they didn't reach out to us to ask us for help. I sent them some goodies, um, T-shirts and stuff. But yeah, they just said, we're going to do this and the mon- the proceeds are going to go to all options. Fantastic. So, you know, that has been... That has been a bright spot. And, and there has been a lot more awareness about what we're doing here. Mostly in a good way. And that does give me hope. New helpers have been showing up even today. Hi, Wes. Hi, yeah. And Jess, to nice to meet you too. We're going to be a couple more minutes. Yeah, and then, um, so I think just like hang out up front and I'll be out there very soon. Cool. All Thank right. You. Thanks. So this is really new volunteer. Yay. Yeah. The new volunteer, Wes, stands in the front room among the diapers, taking it all in. 
I didn't really know this. I don't have kids, but one in three families in the state like don't have the kind of diapers that they need. Um, and so that's that's a big issue and something that is like so impactful for children um, and families. Jessica walks Wes and me around the room to explain how the diaper distribution works. We land at a giant desk. So we have an online order form. People can get supplies once a month. So um, depending on how many children they have, they might get anywhere between 75 to uh, 125 diapers. Wow. Mm -hmm. So Wes was not exactly the person I was expecting to see here as a volunteer. And so I'm wondering, like, how you found out about this, like, what happened to make you want to do this and, and, and kind of how it's feeling? Um, I just think that the, the state of Indiana can be pretty regressive when it comes to reproductive rights. And I'm hoping to volunteer and just see in what way I can give back or understand that reproductive justice extends beyond plan B contraception. Um, I have two older sisters, both of them, um, have, you know, had pregnancy scares and, and been worried about their reproductive rights being taken away. The overturning of Roe is not something that only affects um, women or people that can have children. Um, it's something that affects men as well um, and people that can't have children. And it affects our communities in a very direct way. Um, and we all need to get involved. And this is not something that we can leave up to the legislature to do the right thing. And you can write them, and you can email them, and you can campaign, and all of that is good. But there are families in need here in our community, and we need to help them. So that's why I'm involved. Wes is not an anomaly. Recent polls show most people in Indiana believe abortion should be legal in all or most cases. But we tend not to talk openly about abortion. Back in her office, Jessica says that should change. Many things need to happen to deal with the stigma and our cultural shame around abortion. Um, but I think the first level is, is breaking down the, the silence. I know that every person I've talked to who has shared their story with me has felt the sense of relief and affirmation that really we all deserve. And I think the more people tell their stories, any stories, maybe it's about having a miscarriage or many miscarriages, or maybe it's about having babies and then realizing they're in over their heads um, and wanting to talk about that openly. And, and similarly about having an abortion or having three abortions. Um, that's not my business but it should be my business to accept them. Whatever happens with the Indiana law, all options will be here. Jessica turns back to her big screen. I'm gonna send this message, another message real quick. For Making Contact, I'm Amy Gastelum. Be Hancock. So I decided to use <laughs> use this kind of analytical mind that I have. And I said, okay, wait a minute, let me think about this. I said, is there anything wrong with watermelons? No. Nope. Is there anything wrong with the watermelon man? Nope. That was my answer. There was nothing wrong. And so it was right then that I decided. I have to stand up for what I believe in and what is right and what I feel, follow my heart. And there were even some musicians that, you know, when I told them I wrote this song called Watermelon Man, they said, you're not going to call it Watermelon Man, are you? No, really, it was like, it was like that back then. KPFA, storytelling for social change.